And so, because it is that time of the year, we will be doing a Hana Matsuri Siddhartha Gautama's birthday uh, discussion. And you can go to the next slide. And just leave it there. And this um, is from the Gandhara period. And this actually shows Maya, Shakyamuni Buddha's birth mother, giving birth to him out of her right side. Um, at that time. So looking at your, you can re reference the um, handout. And Siddhartha Gautama's birth was about 2,500 years ago. And there are no known records made at that time of his birth. So that we, what we know or think we know is what has been entered into canonical works and into commentary written hundreds of years after his death. When discussing Buddha's birth, we're often regaled with the previous lives of Shakyamuni Buddha. Often this includes his penultimate birth as Prince Vishvantara. Tales of the past lives are found in the Chitaka tales. Earliest biographies of the Buddha are found in the Vinaya Pitaka in connection with the history of the community. And of course, the Vinaya Pitaka is the record of the 250 or 320 approximately approximate numbers of the rules of conduct that were appropriate for the monastic community. Um, allegorical versions are found in the Abhidhana, the name given to a type of Buddhist literature correlating past lives, virtuous deeds, to subsequent live, lives events. The most complete bibliography is a second century CE, uh, Buddha Karita, in 28 chapters by Shivagosa. And Boswell states the Buddha Karita has served an important role within the Buddhist tradition itself as canonical works do not offer a systematic chronological account of the Buddha's life from his birth to his death. An online version of this can be found at, and you'll see the reference at that point if you care to go through um, the, the full, full account. The date of Siddhartha Gautama's birth is open to different interpretations. The year of his birth vary by about three centuries. <laughs> Consensus by many scholars opine that Siddhartha Gautama of the Shakya clan was born about 563 BCE in Lumbini and raised in the small principality of capital of Astu, both of which are in what is now Nepal. Buddhist scholars and devotees are now split into two camps over when Buddha was born. Some say the mid sixth century to the seventh century BCE, while others believe it was later in the mid to, four, to late fourth century BCE. What they do agree upon is his birthplace, Lumbini, Nepal. Very briefly, I have to tell you that when I'm asked to speak periodically at the Hindu, um, one of the Hindu temples in Albany, it's actually the Hindu temple and community center in Albany. Not, not um, well, I should say many times I'm, I'm asked to speak there during his awakening or during his birth or something along those times. And they know that I'm going to talk about his birth in Lubimi. And they're quick to come over and it never fails. Some little old lady always comes over to me and says, don't forget that the tale says he was born in Nepal, but really he was born in India. <laughs> so among the Hindu community, that can sometimes be a sensitive issue. Um, archaeologists working at Labimi have uncovered evidence that appears to support the earlier birthday. And digging within the grounds at the Maya Devi temple, named after Buddha's mother, the team unearthed a succession of temples carefully oriented to recreate the cosmos. And this is really interesting, the, the site, and place Buddha at its center, the oldest of which would have been outlined in timbers dates to 6th century BC. And what's important about that is not, they were able to date it not only by the stratigraphy, which is normally what you do in an archaeological uh, excavation, but they were also able to date the wood and other elements within that particular dig, and they identified it as the actual place of Shakyamuni 
his birth. So it's interesting that we don't have a written record of his birth, but we do know exactly where he was born because at the time, uh, being in the, the, the grove, that was a place that people knew about very well. They were able to identify and said, that's the spot. And so successive temples were built there over the, over the last 2,500 years. Uh, and some of them, I think the, the lowest one went down to something like uh, 15 meters or so below the ground. But what is the current, the current surface of the ground? Because they kept building on top and building on top and building on top. The story of Buddha's birth may have been appropriated from the Vedic sources, specifically the account of birth of Indra from the Rig Veda. There's also an indication of Hellenic influences. This would have been from the fourth to first centuries uh, BCE, that being from the time of, of Alexander the Great, the Hellenic period, from the time of Alexander the Great until um, a very famous battle, uh, I think it was in 63 uh, BCE. Um, scholars speculate that the story of Gautama's birth was elaborated after Buddhist traders returned from the Middle East with stories of the birth of Jesus. And it's really interesting because on Tuesday morning's discussion, uh, Job and I, is Job, uh, Job isn't there this evening, is he? I don't see him. Uh, Job and I were talking about how information was really transmitted back and forth between various religious traditions. And so what we view as interfaith today is honoring each other's religions and, and supporting them. But over time, there's also been a transmission of different ideas from one religion to the other and one religion appropriating ideas from the other. Uh, and that would seem to be the case. Uh, here where information had been borrowed, well, not really borrowed from Jesus' birth necessarily. I, I wouldn't know enough about Christianity to comment on that, but certainly the idea of a miraculous birth. Imagine a, an elephant comes up and scores the side of Maya, the mother, and into that, into that uh, woman is placed the essence of Shakyamuni Buddha that, that is later then born, i.e. the virgin birth. That's really what it amounts to. Um, so creating miraculous events around the birth, birth of Siddhartha would have elevated his status and the importance of his teaching during a time when such tales were the norm. We look at these tales that we're going to read tonight as, oh man, give me a break. <laughs> On the other hand, it's tales like that that really interested people, maintained a sense of, of superiority of the tradition. Well, you mean your founder did this? Yeah, well, my founder, you know, I, I look at the superheroes we have today. We have movies, you know, Marvel and Dell uh, comics that are then spun into movies. And we're doing really the same thing today. We see superheroes. One versus the other. We have superheroes fighting each other. It's like the Mahabharata. We don't think about it. We, we say, well, that's just a movie. These people believe this stuff. Well, I'm telling you something. Ask a seven-year-old what he thinks of Spider-Man or whomever is the, whoever is the uh, protagonist of a particular, particular movie. Uh, they take it very seriously. Um, and, and, and by the way, I, I don't use social media. And one of the reasons is so that I don't get plunked by somebody who claims that my superhero is better than your superhero. No. You've got Shakyamuni Buddha, I've got Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so Shakyamuni died about 483 BCE, Krishnagar, India, again, according to scholarly consensus. Now, I'm going to read the story and I want you to listen to it, and then you can read it again later. And this is a, a, obviously a very abbreviated version of his birth. With a sense of gratitude that there was a person who dedicated his life to the welfare of all of those who followed him. And the story is not intended to be an accurate rendition. I would maintain that even 2,000 years ago, 
people were listening to the story and thinking, well, I'm not really sure that an elephant piercing the side of a woman and planting an embryo would have actually occurred. To begin with, 2,000 years ago, the idea of an embryo would have been pretty far-fetched. So that's a different issue. Um, but it is intended to open us up to a feeling of wonder and possibility. So I'm going to read the story, and I'm going to ask everyone to just close your eyes while I read this. And with your supervision from Steven Spielberg, imagine what I'm talking about. 25 centuries ago, King Sudana ruled a land near the Himalaya Mountains. One day during a midsummer festival, <coughs> his wife, Queen Maya, retired to her quarters to rest, and she fell asleep and dreamed a vivid dream. Four angels carried her high into white mountain peaks and clothed her in flowers. Magnificent white bull elephant bearing a white lotus in its trunk approached Maya and walked around her three times. Then the elephant struck her on the right side with its trunk and vanished into her. When Maya awoke, she told her husband about the dream. The king summoned 64 Brahmins to come and interpret it. Queen Maya would have given birth to a son, the Brahmins said, and if the son did not leave the household, he would become a world conqueror. However, if he were to leave the household, he would become a great spiritual leader. When the time for the birth grew near, Queen Maya wished to travel from Kapilavatu to the, the king's capital to her childhood home, Ibada, to give birth with the king's blessings. She left Kapilavastu on a palanquin carried by a thousand courtiers. On the way to Divada, the procession passed Lobimi Grove, which was full of blossoming trees. Entranced, the queen asked her courtiers to stop, and she left the palaquin and entered the grove. As she reached up to touch the blossoms, her son was born. Then the queen and her son were showered with perfume blossoms, and two streams of sparkling water poured from the sky to bathe them. And the infant stood and took seven steps and proclaimed, I alone am the world honored one. Then Queen Maya and her son returned to Kapilavastu. The queen died seven days later and the infant prince was nursed and raised by the queen's sister, Pajapati, later known as Maha Pajapati, also married to Queen Shuddhana. And of course, Maya Pajapati was the first woman to enter the uh, Sangha. Now, you can open your eyes. Mm -hmm. A couple of points that I, that I want to make about this was we don't really find angels appearing as such very often in Sutra. Angels tend to be something that is more associated with uh, religious tradition from Persia, Zoroastrianism. The angel is one of the, the main symbols. Additionally, we find this magnificent white bull elephant bearing a white lotus in its trunk, walking around her three times. That's very traditionally a measure of a wedding ceremony in that part of Asia. So this would seem to indicate that there was some kind of a union between the elephant. And of course, this is in her dream. No one is saying this, this occurred um, by some mythic form, but this was, this was her dream. And, you know, we have no evidence that she was using psilocybin. So we have, we have to assume that this was on the up and up. Um, and the fact that, that the elephant struck her on the right side with its trunk and vanished into her seemed to be the white elephant was in fact the embryo of Shakyamuni Buddha. When Maya told her husband, we have it, the Brahmins came and interpreted the, the dream and said that if he didn't leave the household, he was going to become a great a warrior, essentially. He was of the Estri uh, clan, which was a, a warrior, I should say, caste, which was a warrior caste. And if he did leave, then he would be, become uh, a great spiritual leader. Well, 
that is what caused, according to the tale, that's what caused the king to closet Shakyamuni Buddha to keep him from going out into the world to stay within the palace itself so that he would then become the great king after his father. Um, and I think that it's not lost that the, we have to keep in mind also that in India, as in, as in other parts of the world, it's very common <laughs> for a woman to give birth by actually holding on to a tree, a tree limb, to a bush, squatting and giving birth in that way. So reaching up to touch the blossom is relevant in the sense that that would have resonated with the people at that time, because that's how women often gave birth uh, in that part of the world at, at that time. Um, and I find it pretty incredible that there were a thousand uh, courtiers who carried her palanquin. Uh, must have been very crowded carrying this thing since only, you know, let's say four people would normally carry something along those lines. So we know that it was an enhanced story. Um, and the fact that she was showered with perfume blossoms would have demonstrated what a uh, extraordinary event this is. And the sparkling water from the sky bathed them is a purification. We still do something similar to that as a purification uh, to this day. Uh, and of course, the fact that he could walk not one step, not two steps, but seven steps. And seven in geomancy is a very special number. And it proclaimed to the world as an infant, I alone am the world honored one. Now that demonstrates what a nifty guy he was. <laughs> um, so, you know, we could we could go on about this. If we told a longer story, I could go on a long time sort of discussing what are some of the other elements of the full story. But you can see how this how this story weaves in and out of it both the mythic legend as well as items of of the event that would have resonated with with people who had seen someone give birth. Um, and you can see how within that, they're creating an environment in which the, the, the very nature of Shakyamuni Buddha himself, you know, before I was talking about the Lubimi uh, location, the archeological dig, dig in Lubimi, and how that particular location Shakyamuni Buddha's birthplace is in the center of the cosmos, placing him in the center of the world. Now, recognize that when he was asked about things like astrology, when he was asked about things like that, he said, I don't know, ask an astrologer. He wasn't coming forth with that sort of information. But in order to create an aura of respect, an aura of trust in his teachings, they have to make the, the very foundation of this person uh, absolutely miraculous. And keep in mind another thing, and that is within the Pali Canon, which is followed by the Theravada today, um, within that canon, there is the belief in Shakyamuni Buddha as a historic figure, which he certainly was by all accounts. He was, there was this person uh, that we can identify as such as a historic person. And many people say, but it's really the Mahayana that creates the, the, the myths and the legends. Well, this story is coming out of the Pali tradition. It's not coming out of the Mahayana tradition. It's coming out of materials that were written previous to the Mahayana. So uh, keep that in mind. I'm gonna go on to how the birth of Siddhartha Gautama is observed in Japan for just very briefly. And it's a celebration of Shakyamuni Buddha's birth in Japan. And the date is celebrated in Japan on April 8th. It's, it's the same date. Now, other traditions, other Buddhist traditions in other parts of the world have the date at different times. They follow a lunar calendar. Japan started following a Gregorian calendar in the middle of the 19th century. So they can specify the date 
April 8th for his birth, December 8th for his awakening, uh, et cetera. And it's really necessary to recognize that in South Asia, his birth is a civil holiday. It's a national holiday. Everybody takes off from work for the day, and but they do it as Vesic. They they combine his birth, awakening, and death into one day, based upon a calendar, um, the, the a lunar calendar. And a lunar calendar in Tibet is going to be different than a lunar calendar in Sri Lanka or a lunar calendar in another in another region. And so it it changes from year to year in Japan. It's on that date, and it's not a um, a civil holiday, but it is observed in temples in many municipalities. And there are many forms that they can take, including flower shows, parades at temples. The pouring of amacha over the baby Buddha is very common, which is what we'll be doing in Hondo this evening. Uh, the fixed date and the manner of observance are unique to Japanese Buddhism. And it's celebrated in a similar fashion by all the Buddhist schools in Japan. And I might ask Ishishima Sensei, when I completed this, when we go to uh, thoughts and comments, if he might like to comment on uh, Buddha's birthday, uh, what will be happening this year. So I'm going to end here asking that everyone be a little bit less cynical, less critical about the legend, about the myth. We get so hung up. When we hear it's a myth, and if you if you want to persist on being hung up about it, I'm addressing it in the Dharma talk. So save your skepticism till then. Um, allow yourself to enjoy, enjoy and feel appreciated appreciation for the person that initiated the path that focuses us on a search for the nature of reality. So I'll end there, and you can go on to the thoughts and questions and. Um, and then I'd also like to ask after Ichishima Sensei might have a comment to make. Um, I would like to ask the people who were present how you perceive the birth of the person who would eventually become Shakyamuni Buddha. But Ichishima Sensei, do you have any comments you'd you like to make about Buddha's birthday? Maybe the way um, your temple. Sensoji will be self will be observing this. Well, we have uh, maybe Buddha and uh, people come and uh, pour the uh, tea. That is called tea of heaven or hydrangea tea or something like that. But uh, very sweet. And uh, we did it uh, when I was in Hawaii, uh, ten day mission of Hawaii. I celebrated and decorated uh, flowers the house of baby Buddha, and many kids come and pour uh, sweet tea on the head of Buddha Gautama. Well, the uh, name itself, Gautama, uh, that is Sanskrit. Go means ox. Tama is uh, excellent. Uh, and the Siddha Arta, Arta is a meaning of life. Siddha means attain, perfected the meaning of life. This is a decoration, but anyway, uh, Gautama Siddhartha, uh, later he became uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, and enlightened one among the uh, Shakyamuni families. Anyway, this uh, 8th of, 8th of, uh, 8th of uh, April, uh, celebrated in uh, Hawaii as a national uh, state holiday. It, I'm, I was very surprised. In Japan, nothing, but uh, uh, Hawaii, and they celebrate uh, the day, uh, 8th of April, as a, a state holiday. It's, I think uh, it was amazing. That is my just uh, comment. Thank you very much, Ichishima Sensei. I'd like to ask other people, what is your thoughts on um, Shakyamuni Buddha's Siddhartha Gautamas, to be more precise? What is his, on his birthday? Anybody? Chip, go ahead. Uh, I'm amazed at some of the accounts I, I read 
um, like like Stephen Batchelor and stuff, that how much they know about his life um, and the, the palace and, and how many blocks it was to somebody else's house and stuff like that. I always thought this was myth, but but it seems like from, and I think it goes along with what you're saying, we, we actually know a lot of the actual houses and and town that he was living in was it 2,500 years ago? Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or comments? Ralph? Yeah, the thought or comment I had was, I find it rather interesting um, that uh, the Buddha's birth, um, uh, Ramadan also, uh, Passover, and the Christian Holy Week all occur at the same time of the year in April. Yeah, well, I think that, that part of it is that, you know, Buddha's birth is given when it is based upon a calendric, uh, the calendric system at the time, and it would have been the eighth day of the fourth month. And of course, in a lunar calendar, that's going to change from year to year, much the way uh, Easter changes. Because Easter is then based upon Passover, and that was a Monday, Thursday was the first night of Passover. So the second night would have been the uh, what we refer to as the Last Supper in the Christian context. And Ramadan, I, I don't know why. Well, it changes every year uh, by one month. So this year, it's April 2nd until May 2nd. Last year, it was May 2nd until June 2nd. The previous year, it was June 2nd until July 2nd. So Ramadan changes every year based upon the Muslim lunar calendar. Um, but this year, it happens to be occurring at the same time. Yeah. So, it, so Ramadan just happens to be at the same time this year, but that's not... And that only happens about every 12 years. <laughs> yeah. And, and to go even further, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ancient oh, historic uh, uh, European tribal people and so on also uh, uh, celebrated uh, the, the beginning of the new year, the beginning of the year, they celebrated it at the beginning of, of spring. In other words, in April. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the pagan traditions, uh, 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 Easter, uh, for example, was uh, was was borrowed by the Christian Church from the ancient pagan traditions, uh, 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 which uh, well, basically. They, but they also it was also based upon the Zoroastrian calendar because the Zoroastrian calendar starts the new year in you, typically April. It can it can be for anywhere from April to May. Yes. Um, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, I have yeah. a question. Yeah, go ahead. Now, you mentioned the Jatakata tales, the uh, pa past lives of the Buddha. How did that come about? How did the Jataka tales came, come about? Yeah. That was commentary that was intended to make story, and, and well, it was commentary intended to make the story of Buddhism more interesting, especially for children and to people who are illiterate, that we're not gonna really understand philosophy, philosophical concepts. Uh, and so the Jataka Tales came about as a way to explain it to people in, in, simple, in a very simple fashion. And many of them were in fact based upon Vedic uh, traditions. Yeah, so yeah. in the Jataka Tales are many, many Vedic um, uh, yeah, tales um, rewritten, you know. Yeah. Thank you, that was a good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I find it very interesting. I just, I'm new at the birth of Buddha, and the parallels with Christ's birth in that there's this section of a human being that's born, but it doesn't come from the normal way that people right. are born. And it, 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 I'm struck by, you know, it's coming from somewhere totally different. Humanity comes, but yet the person is born, lives a normal life as a human being. I didn't, I didn't know the elephant um, 
story. The, the story of the elephant, yeah. Well, and, and, and just keep in mind that, that what we know about birth today, we had, I mean, midwives have been around as long as human beings have been delivering babies, right? Mm -hmm. There have been midwives, someone who was assigned to assist a woman during birth. And so we knew the mechanics of giving birth but we didn't know the biology of how it occurs. People didn't understand the nature of sperm and the egg uh, within the uterus. Uh, you'll see up until uh, the Renaissance and even later, you'll see pictures of little homunculus, little human beings dripping out of the penis of the male into the woman, for instance. That was the, the way that it was often portrayed. And so, you know, You've got to have some story about how it came up. And a white elephant piercing the side sounds pretty good, you know? <laughs> any other any other thoughts? I have a mother now. <laughs> right, we all have a mother. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And but and, and I, I think speaking to Chip's point, the, the point that Chip was making earlier. I too am, am amazed about how much we do know, considering that it was a totally oral tradition until several hundred of years after his death. And that um, there was a, nonetheless, a recording out now recognized that he was not a simple peasant in that society. He was born from a, uh, a parent who was parents who were well known, they were equivalent to kings, although it's interesting because we, we call them a monarchy, but in fact, Kapilavastu was probably an oligarchy, it probably was not a monarchy, it wasn't really a royal lineage, though it's often portrayed that way. Uh, and that's based upon what historians are saying more recently now. But nonetheless, he was born uh, to a well-known family. And so there would have been records kept of the birth of a person of that nature. And I think that, that what is often um, amazing to me is the fact that the tales were oral, but the oral, the oral transmission was such that it was pretty consistent, you know, until 200 years or so after his death, when it was, begun, well, almost 300 years, when it began to be put into a print in which there was a, a written record of these things. So it, it's amazing to me that, as Chip was saying, that it is as we can verify some of those things. We can verify where in Lubimi he was actually born. But we stop and think about that, how amazing that is. Um, 2,500 years ago, that's just, mm -hmm. it, it's really very, very amazing. Any other thoughts or questions? Hey, yeah, Ralph, did you? Uh, yeah, um, along the lines of what you just said about uh, the oral tradition, um, my understanding uh, was that the the, the sangha uh, uh, from the time that the uh, that the Buddha died, um, uh, uh, more or less regularly got together. Not maybe not all of them, but uh, a bunch of them, and would go ahead and and recite. Um, uh, recount uh, the 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 uh, the the teachings, the suttas, uh, uh, and probably also uh, the location and the birth, and would go ahead and and actually check each other uh, uh, to make sure that that every member of the sangha had the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 had the had the right story, had everything uh, 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 down pat, um, and that that's part of the reason why. Um, uh, what we get in the uh, in the Pali Canon is is probably uh, 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 at least reasonably accurate um, uh, uh, as to uh, as to what actually happened. I agree, but it wasn't just the Buddhist Sangha because when you look at the Hindu tradition, there are people who recite the Mahabharata. Yeah, that is, that is the origin myth within the Vedic tradition, and the Mahabharata would fit on the a bookshelf. It's so it's so enormous, and yet there are people who can to this day still recite that. So you know, we most of us have grown grown up in a society where memorization has receded farther and farther and farther from necessity, and 
we don't even think that we have to memorize or remember anything anymore because I can always do it on a search engine. Why should I remember this stuff? I can just look it up at a moment's notice. I've got a, a, an additional brain that yeah. punch into it. wife just said you could, you could Google anything now. Well, I don't Google anything, but you can do it on a search engine. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> As long as the power's on. <laughs> as long as the power's on, good point. Yeah. As long as the power's on and the internet is up and your and your cable provider has got the cable going. Right. Jake, you have your hand up. And this will yeah. be the last question. Yeah, well, it's not really a question so much as a comment. Um I was watching quite a few months ago now a uh, an adaptation of a Chinese novel called The Investiture of the Gods, which you can find on Amazon Prime. And that came out, I think it was written in the 1600s. And it was interesting to me that in the show, so the show is supposed to be the fall of the Shang dynasty. And at some point in the show, one of the characters starts talking about the Buddha being, you know, existing and all this kind of stuff way before what modern, modern scholarship would say uh he was born and it was really interesting to me and i was searching this up and apparently people there were a lot of people who thought that even as far as like a thousand bc that the buddha existed and it was it was just really fascinating to me to see that kind of shift before modern scholarship to now yeah. Yeah. so i will thank everyone for listening to the discussion i'll ask the people who were in the gathering room here to go out to the hondo. We read the legend of Shakyamuni Buddha's birth. Some people might rightfully claim that the story is not rational. Why should we perpetuate it? Those people are correct in that the story would not stand up to irrational analysis. That doesn't mean it's not important. That doesn't mean that such a narrative has no value. It excited the imagination of generations of people for millennia, bringing those people to better understand the value of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings, which were passed down first orally and then later in writings. Zakata writes, the beauty of nature is the manifestation of existence itself. It is beautiful simply because it is beautiful. To say that color is waves of light and nothing more is pointless. Existence produces its own beauty for itself and appreciates it by itself. In other words, we apply different forms of explanation to different phenomena in different cases. We can look at the stars and feel a sense of wonder at the impenetrable vastness of the universe. A sense of awe is produced. I can recognize that I, my body, and my consciousness is an infinitely tiny part of this cosmos. If so inclined, we can also see patterns in the clear night sky that are constellations, Sagittarius or Orion's belt that have been meaningful for both astronomers and astronomers, astronomers and astrologers alike. Same patterns, different interpretations. One science, the other is a belief that the stars have an influence on the course of natural earthly occurrences and human affairs. Evidence suggests that over 90% of adults know their zodiac signs and 76% feel it is at least partially scientific. Keep in mind that what was once started as astrology became astronomy. Interestingly, we can explore both with a sense of amazement. We can go a bit deeper and explore astrophysics, identifying suns billions and billions of light years from our eyes that gaze out using seemingly miraculous instrument like the Hubble telescope. The information that it provides is satisfying and satisfies a certain type of curiosity. We accept all three versions with different parts of our belief systems and different ways we integrate it in our lives. That's the nature of reality. 
from a Tendai perspective. It is not dualistic, right and wrong. Reality is free from the conceptual. It is a realization that what we think we know is just what we think, not what is real. Rather than dismiss the mythic story of Siddhartha's life, we might embrace it as a flight of imagination that was produced from a profound devotion to the teachings, a sense of wonder at how a person 2,500 years ago was able to, through the methods he elaborated, have an insight into the nature of reality, and that has liberated many unknown millions of people from dukkha and ameliorated the discontentedness of many billions of people more. Svaha. And I will unmute you. Well, actually, I can't unmute you. You have to unmute yourself, but I can hit the unmute button. And we will continue on. Hold on just a moment. And the final quote is, we must be willing to let go of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us.